What is precious is never to forget. My name is Frida Jaffe, or in another life I was known as Freja Geltzman, born in now Piotrkov, Poland, which is central Poland, uh, very near Lodz. And that was, that was my beginning in Piotrkov, but then my parents and I, and later on a baby brother, lived in a small city called Lututov, also in Poland, about a, maybe a hundred kilometers from the central Piotrkov Lodz area. Freja, how old were you when the Shoah began? I was born in 1937, so I was two years old at the outbreak of World War II. Can you tell us about your life before the Nazi invasion? Oh, I have some lovely photographs of me on outings with my parents when I was probably three years old. It must have been, maybe, maybe the war had already started, but just not gotten to Lutetov yet. Um, always loved to be outdoors, always loved to be around flowers and uh, gardens and uh, really don't have too many recollections at that point as far as life with my parents or don't remember the birth of my baby brother. That was, uh, that was later. Frasia, when the war touched your young life, what do you remember? My very, very young, as I call it, my so-called childhood really has to do with some pretty traumatic things that happened. The first huge, huge event that, that I, I do remember very clearly, I didn't know then that it was in January of 1942, but I just in the last few years have learned this, when my father was publicly executed by hanging in Lututov, and I very clearly remember the day that troops, I don't know whether they were uh, Nazi troops, German troops, uh, Ukrainian troops, or just the local police, but there were people in uniform who broke into our, our home and uh, literally dragged my father out of bed. He was ill. I really can't, the, the noise, the, the fright. Uh, my mother was in the process of, of curling my hair. I was sitting on a bench at the foot of my father's bed. And um, I, I remember that so clearly when my father didn't come back, but we were forced along with the entire population of the town to the town square to uh, witness an execution at the execution, and that I remember very clearly, uh, watching uh, my father, and I, my memory, I haven't been able to prove it or disprove it, but in my memory there were two other men on either side of my father who were led across the square, but they weren't just led toward the gallows, I do remember. 
Currently, there was a war crimes trial in Poland in the late 1970s or early 1980s. Had nothing to do with um, uh, Jews, Nazis, but it had to do with the Nazi regime against Poles and war crimes that were committed against Polish citizens during the occupation. I found out that one of the, uh, the people that was brought to this trial was the commandant of Lutetov. His name was uh, Dit Berner, and the Polish government was charging him with war crimes. And because of Dit Berner's activities during the the occupation, something was brought up about the execution, and it is very much documented in a number of books, of one Joseph Gelsman. And the testimony that was given was, uh, one of them was that the personal enmities against Joseph Gelsman was that um, he refused to turn over. My father was a, uh, a master tanner. They had always been in the leather business, leather factories, and apparently he had, uh, from, from what someone in my family had told me, he, w he was a chemist, and he had created or, or uh, discovered a tanning process where he could take useless animal hides that prior to that had just been thrown away. Uh, and if we know anything about how much the Germans loved their leather, you know how important leather was for them, for their boots, for their belts, for their, their uniforms and all. The factory, all the Jewish businesses had been confiscated and turned over to German or Volksdeutsch, uh, Polish nationals, a uh, German background. And so he became an employee in his own factory, but apparently he demanded, uh, went up to Ditburner at one point and demanded better working conditions, food and medical care for his workers. And according to one of the testimonies of one of the people at this Ditburner trial, that was really the reason that they wanted to make an example of him with this public, this public hanging. And um, one of the testimonies of one of the witnesses that still remembered who, who testified at this trial against Ditburner said that nobody will forget the strength and the pride with, with which Joseph Gelsman was led to the gallows and that the only thing, and it's, it's in my testimony that I have, that the only thing that he asked of his citizens was to please take care of his wife and children. He didn't ask anything for himself. He was hanged. Frasia, let's continue with your memories of life in the Pietrakov ghetto. How, do I, how does a five-year, by then I was four and a half, close to five years of age. It, it was a, a time of, about the only thing that I can honestly tell you is that all I can really remember is fear, hunger, pain, and just terror. Every day there were things that were going on and of course, uh, uh, I was, we were with my grandmother, my grandfather, there were several other aunts, sisters of my mother who were still living there. Um, and there were bombings and shootings and being, being me, if I heard anything, I would run to the window and the windows in the building were very, very big. It was a major, major street. Um, Pilsudskiego was just one of the main streets and it turned out that it ended up being within the ghetto itself, but because it was sort of a border street, we did not, my grandparents did not have to leave the apartment. Others were jammed into uh, some of the rooms and as they were brought in from some of the other 
ghettos, but we, we stay there until that fateful week, that terrible week in October when all the deportations were. But I remember the fear. I remember just looking out the window and just seeing people were being beaten, people were being literally shot on the street. We were very scared and, and very frightened with things that were going on outside that we heard of. We would all huddle, meaning whoever was uh, in, in the house or in the apartment, we would all huddle into a closet. But it really wasn't a closet at all because I remember in the back of the closet, somehow they would, my grandparents would push this wall aside and it was a small room. And during all those periods, um, a ch you can't talk, you can't laugh, you can't cry, you can't be heard while we're in this gathering place. I don't even remember for, for during those times the luxury of laughing or crying. I apparently had the reputation in the Piotrkov ghetto of, um, as I tell some students when I speak to them, <laughs> they think that Harry Potter uh, had the first invisibility cloak, but I tell the students that they're wrong, that Freja was the very first one to have an invisibility cloak, because for all the shenanigans that I, as a small child, got myself into, Nobody saw me. I just was not visible. So I must have had an invisibility cloak over me. It's the only reason I can think of that I'm sitting here speaking with you. October 1942, the liquidation of the Pietrakov ghetto. Tell us, Frasia. October, I think it was from the 14th. It was a seven day period where the the trains departed from the Piotrkov, from the city of Piotrkov, from the town square. The citizens were rounded up every single day for that entire week, and the cattle cars were filled every single day. I didn't know that then, but as the names were called out on a daily basis, when the quota was filled and the cars were filled, they departed, and then the next day, the same story. And that final destination for the people there was Treblinka, and it was a one-way trip. My mother and my baby brother were one of those days. They, my grandparents, my aunts, just almost the entire family, the only ones that did not uh, did not go on those transports during that week was one of my mother's sisters and a brother and me. Well, I don't, I don't know how I escaped it. I, things happen. I was, I was Freja. And when we apparently had to stand at attention or stand in that square for hours and hours on a daily basis. There wasn't any way that Freja was just going to do that. And so being close to the ground, I, walked, I just wandered around. I wove my way. I remember weaving my way through legs, looking for things to play with. There were probably some mice or some rats or some animals that I befriended that I just had to take care of. After all, they needed me. And it wasn't until I heard Paula Geltzmann. I heard it. I heard it being called out. What? That's Mama. And so I, wherever I was with this multitude of people in this town square, working my way th again through their feet to run, to be, I, if if my mother was, her name was called, I needed to be there, she was holding my baby brother. <sighs> Rabbi, I don't. And I remember being, as I was trying to push through the crowd, through the feet, I was grabbed. And someone put a hand over my mouth and just shoved me to the ground. I wasn't, I wasn't very high off the ground. It was my Aunt Gucha my mother's sister. 
and she kept me down and then I stayed with her until she was sent off to a labor camp and then I was with my uncle Bernard my mother's brother who was also doing slave labor in the, the ghetto in Piotrkov until he was transported and then I was passed on to whatever distant relative by marriage still happened to be in the ghetto until the final liquidation in the, toward the end of 1944. But to go back to, to my mother, I, I recently wrote uh, an essay, uh, a paper, and I was trying to describe uh, strength and courage and I was, I was really trying to think, how do you describe a mother who is walking purposely, she has no choice, toward the, the train, toward the cars, and hears her child calling, and does, has the strength, has the courage, has the fortitude to not turn around, to not acknowledge her child, knowing that if she did, that child would be joining her on whatever journey. She did not know where her journey was leading, but she did know that she didn't want me there. And what I think about that, I just who can, who can do that? Who? That's... That. Fragile, your your mother and your brother were just taken off to Treblinka, where they were murdered. And your father was murdered. And you're now by yourself. In 1942. Can you tell us the journey that took you till 1945? And he just pointed over there where the women were. Then after that, I recall a uh, very painful, a very. Um, just a, a very, very rough, every, again, it was winter, it, it was cold. The only clothes that we, that I had or anybody had was just what we were wearing that day. And a train and a terrible drive and a lot of crying and a lot of hunger and a lot of, I, I don't even recall any uh, sanitary facilities if there was anything on there, but I did learn much, much later from some other uh, couple of women from Piotrkov who were on that transport that we, um, that it took four days and that we did arrive in Germany and it was a place called Ravensbrück. And what the only, the only really traumatic experience that, that happened to me other than the normal afraid and, and, and they're screaming and the crying and people didn't want, they were, this was just women and, ch and girls. And I just remember soon after arrival that um, I was taken to a small room. I think I learned many, many years later that that was a hospital area in that block of buildings in Ravensbrück because in studying about it, I learned that terrific and horrific experiments were carried on by doctors on the women and women girl and girl children that did not that did not happen to me but i was taken into a room and and my head was shaved and i remember i didn't know then uh, because i didn't certainly didn't speak very many languages but apparently there were french women who were prisoners there and who were doing the shaving, the, the de-lousing and, and the shaving of the heads. And this one young woman was crying as she was clipping my hair off and she really, and gave me something 
that she had, I think it was a piece of an orange or a piece of something because I, had, I didn't remember ever having tasted that before. Memory, the recollection of my mother and the, uh, the tenderness about it, the, the, the holding of the hair. And besides, I think I was probably pretty vain too because uh, remember I talked about never leaving the house unless I was just so, and you've seen on the little photographs of me with my apron and my little purse, and I was probably a miserable little critter at the time too, that I just had to be. My mother was a beautiful, beautiful woman. She probably took very good care of of us, I can see that from the photographs. So I was probably, I'm not sure what the bond was, but the hair and the mother and the fingers and the curling, it all connected from me when we got to Ravensburg. Because we had to strip, because we all, whatever the bathing, the shaving, the, the sanitary thing that was done. I don't remember how I got the skirt and blouse that I somehow ended up with, but the skirt and blouse in Ravensbrück, that's all I had. Some rag form of that when the British entered the camp. Ravensbrück, for me, it was a transit. We were all, I was only there a few weeks with the people that came with me from Piotrkov. And from there <coughs> was the, my final uh, destination as far as Germany and as far as death camps and it was to a hell hole by the name of Bergen-Belsen. It was January and it was cold and snow and rain and mud. I just remember mud. And again it was it was barren, it was uh, height of winter, it was probably the coldest winter I've ever I ever remember. Um, so there was this tree and I thought that it was probably a wonderful vantage point for what I didn't know. But I realized that I didn't want to be in the barracks and I was afraid to be really out in the open and there was nothing else to be done. Um, so I got this other girl and we dug. Remember there was, it was just mud and water and rain and this tree that didn't have any leaves on it, but there was just enough of a, of a curbing to it that I must have felt that it was somewhat protective. And we dug this hole and it was just enough for us to get in there and squat into it and the eyes and the face could observe what was going on. And of course, there was also moments where I would, we, I would peel bark just dead bark off the tree to, to eat. And whatever was swimming or caught my attention, it, it was it just, that's what I did. Except for the fact there were all of these little buildings and then on the other side of these little buildings there were just dead corpses and they kept adding corpses, naked dead corpses. And I do remember at one time thinking, where are the clothes? That, that just, it was a, a moment. But they were there and they kept piling them on and they were overflowing from these wooden sheds, I suppose. And there were, there were times when there was a lot of danger, uh, some shootings that were going on, the guards that were up in the guard towers, uh, people that were roaming around and I would I discovered that I could hide inside with the corpses and that they also kept me warm and I, I suppose in in my child's mind that was as safe a place as I could find but 1945 the British come and find the camp and well, it was a day like no other. And why I say that, I don't know, except that, that there was just something, it was something different. It was noise, trucks, uh, just, it wasn't, it wasn't 
gun noise. It wasn't bomb noise. It was just noise. And next thing I know, I'm running to my to my hiding place and I see these soldiers, the uniforms. Now remember, a uniform to me meant fear, death, destruction, bad. I don't know one uniform from another. I just see men in uniform and I see trucks and jeeps. I didn't even know what a jeep was, but wheels. And I was scared and I, I went into hiding. I don't know how long I stayed there. But finally there was one, one gentleman. I remember he had, had a little mustache and, and I, think, I think the uniform, I think it was green, but I wouldn't have known color. Somehow he got me to face him and he squatted down and he kind of in his own, I, just, I didn't speak, I didn't know he was speaking English. I didn't know who he was. He was, it had to be bad because he was wearing a uniform. But he convinced me in some fashion and then there was an interpreter that he would not hurt me, that everything would be all right. And Asia, the war is over. Hitler has been defeated. You're seven years old. Is there anyone in the family that can come and take care of you? There was no earthly, earthly idea for anyone to be looking for me. The day, oh, months later, uh, I was told, this is in Bergen Belsen, uh, I was very sick. I was distended, malnutrition. It was like this, but I did not have typhus. I don't know whatever else I had materialized a few years later, but at that time, uh, and the hair was kind of beginning to grow back. And I was told that um, the next day that I was going to be going to Sweden, that there was a family there who wanted to adopt me. And I remember hearing the word train and the word, uh, I think there was a bus that was supposed to take, or, or, or a truck, I think it was a, tr uh, a big truck, to the train station. And the only thing that I remember is saying, I'm not going. And I said, I, I'm not going because my uncle is coming for me. There was no uncle, there was no way of where that came out of my mouth. But I was told later that under the age of 10, we're talking very, very young children, in, the, in that group and in the photograph that I have, uh, the, very, the first couple of rows, very young children, that I was just one of 15. And you're in that picture, but you're, it's hard to find you. So I will show you. Oh, I did not want my picture taken. And at the very last moment, when we were told to whatever one says to do when a camera's pointed, I ducked. So what you see is, it looks like a boy's haircut, but it, the hair was just beginning to grow back, and I just put my head down. The will the um, the chutzpah of a child to say or to even think of what I can or can't or will or won't do I don't know but I have to believe that as ornery as I was uh, spunky whatever English terminology you want to apply to it is probably what got me through unless you want to say that it was the hand of God and I don't think that I want to go into that right now. Okay, I can respect that. From there on, you said to me the other day that that's when your Shoah, your Holocaust began. That is a very interesting and almost philosophical topic with me because I didn't know anything else up until 
the so-called liberation 1945. I didn't know that that was not normal lifestyle, uh, that people weren't supposed to just disappear and never come back, that dead corpses were lying around, that I didn't know children had beds to sleep in, normal food, baths, love, caring, uh, family. I, th th this, this was something totally unknown to me. Now, I'm hitting, I'm now eight years old. My aunt and uncle find me. They survived horrors of their own. I didn't know any of that. Uh, they're looking for a place, a, a job. Where, where can they go? What can they do? And now they've got me. I am a handicap. I was nine years old before I ever stepped foot in a classroom. And by that time we were in Belgium. It, everything was transitory. It was until such and such, or maybe such and such. And I never had any connection to anything. It was as though all of a sudden I was supposed to know how to live. All of a sudden I was supposed to, to understand finally the realization that my family was not coming back. I, I must have known that when I saw my father hanging, but when you're four and a half years old, I'm not sure how the realization settles in. I remember very clearly when I stopped asking when Mama was coming back because finally it dawned on me at the age of five that she wasn't. So here it is, I'm supposed, the war is over, I'm supposed to be free. What? Where? With whom? What happens? Freida, born June 16, 1937. Oh my God, I really did have my birthday right all along. Although it had appeared in the various camps at different dates, different times, but at least my Aunt Gucha said you were born June 16, 1937. And here, finally, I see it. Father Joseph Geltzmann, mother, Paula, Perla. This was, this date, this April date in 2008, I really, really feel is really the beginning of my life as an adult, as a child who became an adult. Because for so many years, every time I, uh, I speak in front of a group or, or I do a Yom HaShoah program, I always feel as though I came out of nowhere, no roots, no, nothing that, that indicated that I really had a family.